more seriously about climate change and what were the implications for the whole department. So um, we started by, uh, we, we wanted to do the, this um, obviously face to face, but I think we soon had to, to change and most of them have taken place actually online. Um, and um, I think Laura's uh, and my objective is to really bring a very broad set of discussions and debates and to really honor the interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary perspective that the department has and that a topic like this requires. So we have had more discussions uh, from a policy perspective, um, some of them more economic or they're more uh, diverse, including on social policy. And we will think about more on the social movement angle in the future. We are trying to expand um, what the whole series uh, uh, implies by, for example, involving more students in parallel initiatives. Uh, and I want to thank Laura uh, very much for uh, many of these initiatives. Um, although I think Laura will present um, the main speaker today, I want to personally uh, thank uh, Steve Keen. Uh, it's really exciting um, to have you and to have uh, this perspective and to thank um, Professor David Bynes, Professor Nikita Sud, and uh, Professor Matthew Ives for coming and um, following up the discussion. And again, um, being truly multidisciplinary therefore in uh, what we have today. So um, let me stop talking because I shouldn't be talking much and uh, move to Laura um, who will chair the session. And this gives me an opportunity to thank you, Laura, uh, once again for all the effort and all the work uh, in the climate change series. Thank you very much, Diego. Earth and climate scientists have become increasingly alarmist in their declarations about the state of our planet. Calls for urgent radical transformative action in response to the existential threat posed by accelerating climate change and degradation of the biosphere are multiplying. Since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, many intellectuals and academics around the world have argued that we must redesign the modern civilization in which we live without delay. Economics, which became a field of intense contestation in the aftermath of the 2008 global economic crisis, is now under fierce criticism for a, from a growing number of economists themselves. Heterodox economists, such as those who work at Audit, have long challenged the shortcomings of standard economics, as well as a lack of attention from the parts of neoliberals to human, social, and cultural values. However, orthodox economic theory must now be challenged for its systemic discounting of the natural environment and its lack of ecological engagement. It is good to give value to labor and human capabilities, but not enough to create strong climate justice policies. We are therefore extremely pleased to have with us this evening one of the world's leading voices advocating the urgent need to overturn the dominant paradigm in the field of economics and to design a radically different paradigm with a new standard curriculum for the teaching of economics. Professor King is a distinguished research fellow at UCL, the author of very well-known books, starting with Debunking Economics in 2011, and a new book that is just about to be launched, The New Economics, a Manifesto. Uh, he is one of the few economists who anticipated the global financial crisis of 2008, for which he received the, Re the Revere Award from the Real World Economics Review. His main research interests are developing the complex systems approach to macroeconomics and the economics of climate change. He has over 100 referred publications on financial instability, money creation, logical and mathematical flows in conventional and Marxian economic theory, the role of energy in production, and many other topics. He is ranked in 19th in academic influences list of influential economists. He has designed the open source system dynamic program Minsky, 
which is the first program to allow monetary economic models to be designed visually. He has previously been a professor of economics at Kingston University, London, and at the University of Western Sydney in Australia. He will be talking to us tonight from Bangkok. So uh, Steve is very much a global citizen, as we can see. Tonight, he will explain to us why William Nordhaus, 2018 co-winner of the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences for his work on economic growth, technological change, and climate change, cannot deliver a climate economics that will save us from extinction. Whereas Nordhaus famously wrote in 1994 that our future lies not in the stars, but in our models, Professor Kim will show that without properly integrating economics and ecology, and by incorporating the role of energy in economic models of production, we will not be able to manage the global commons. So as Diego was saying, we are going to have a fantastic lecture by Steve with the title of From Economic Fantasy to Ecological Reality on Climate Change. And the format of tonight is trying to engage a little bit more the various constituencies uh, around which we have developed um, the lecture series. And we will have three colleagues here at Oxford who are going to each respond to the lecture for five minutes. There will be David Vines, who is Emeritus Professor of Economics and Emeritus Fellow of Balliol College. Then Nikita Sud, who is a colleague here at Audit, um, a lecturer in um, South Asia Economic Development, the political economy of, of South Asia in development. And then Matthew Eves, who is senior researcher on the complexity of economic modeling here at the Oxford Martin Institute for New Economic Thinking. Steve will then respond to them for a few minutes and then the, the floor will be open to uh, questions. We have made sure that the Q&A is open to all foreseeing. We know that we won't be able to answer all the questions, but we will curate this event. It will be recorded and on our specially dedicated website, along with the side events and the fora that we are also trying to curate, where students can put together events to express how they want to debate the field of climate change and development, because everything at the moment is very much about debate. We need a lot more debate, a lot more of exchange of ideas across departments here in Oxford and across all the networks in which we are involved at all did. So, um, Professor Keen, please, the floor is for you now. Thank you very much again for joining us tonight. Well, many thanks for the invitation and, and the uh, substantial audience. I'm, I'm very pleased to be speaking and uh, I hope it's a good exchange as well as uh, I have an interesting presentation. I'll start doing that now. So I hope you got to wait till you get confirmation. You can see my screen there. Okay. As you said, Laura, the title is going to be From Economic Fantasy to Ecological Reality on Climate Change. I'll just minimize the uh, number of faces that I see. I find Zoom overwrites uh, the video of people with the uh, on the text. So I'll see if I can make that happen. Uh, less obtrusive as the, as the talk goes on. Uh, now, I'm going to start actually with another Nobel Prize winner in economics. This is Robert Solow. And uh, I don't, if you don't know Robert Solow's writing, you would not know what a humorist a man can be, as well as a mathematician. Uh, but after the, uh, the global financial crisis, which Laura mentioned in her introduction, Robert Solow was one of a number of economists invited to explain why economists didn't see the crisis coming. And he wanted a wonderful speech, which is easily accessible online. And he started by saying that uh, when things are as important as macroeconomics, everything should every proposition should pass the smell test. Does it really make sense? And his judgment was that DSG models, which of course still dominate economics, you know, 15 years almost after the financial crisis, don't pass the smell test. 
and he takes the he, he's the person of course who developed growth theory uh, after the before the rediscovery of, of Ramsey's work his model was the neoclassical growth model and he says effectively that you you cannot model the economy as a single individual or dynasty carrying out a rashly designed plan uh, subject to occasionally unexpected shocks he said it doesn't pass the smell test and he then says well the people who promote this stuff say well it's the only way we can actually meet the requirements of microeconomics but he says he thinks that claim is phony and there's very good reasons to think that as well and he says the advocates seem to believe what they say and that also applies as i'll find in climate change but they seem to have stopped sniffing or to have lost their sense of smell altogether and I think that's very, very true of what I'm about to show you. And a wonderful punchline, a thoughtful person faced with that economic policy based on that kind of idea might reasonably wonder what planet he or she is on when it comes to economic advice. Now, let's look at the let's apply the smell test to neoclassical economics on, uh, on climate change. Here's a few examples. This is from Nordhaus in 1991, a three degree rise in global temperature will cause damages equivalent to about one quarter of 1% of output. And a couple of fungers might get it to at most 2%, but no more than an informed hunch. That's not in 91. 2018, after he won the Nobel Prize, describing his DICE model, which of course didn't exist in 91, he said, including all factors, the damage equation assumes that damage is at 2.1% of global income at three to three degrees of warming and 8.5 percent of global income at six degrees of warming uh, again there's a recent paper by khan and mahadis of your rival the university of cambridge being a, a site for uh kamiya mahadis an increase in average global temperatures of 0 0.4 0 0.04 percent per annum which means a 3.2 degree increase over current levels which themselves are about 1.2 over uh, pre-industrial, so we're talking a 4.4 degree rise over pre-industrial, reduces world real GDP per capita by seven, and I love the precision here, 7.22% by 2100. Now that, if you work it out what it means in terms of a effect on the annual rate, rate of growth of per capita income, that is a 0.1% fall from 1.5% per annum to 1.4% per annum. Now, frankly, economists, when they measure GDP change, can't get it right to within half a percent. So it's ridiculous. This is basically saying the effect is too small to measure. Uh, and here we have a recent paper, which I'm going to be focusing on in my talk by Dietz et al. at Al in 2021. Tipping points. So they're modeling tipping points. Well, that's good. Tipping points reduce global consumption per capita by about 1% upon three degrees of warming and about 1.4% upon six degrees warming. Uh, in other words, they're trivial. Now on planet Earth, the other place that Robert Rosello realized we're on that economists are not, scientists are afraid of a two degree warming. Hansen in 2015 said it very bluntly, two degrees warming could be dangerous. Stefan in 2018 said that that level of warming could activate tipping points that push us into what he called a hothouse Earth. Lenton in 2019, tipping points could be exceeded even between one and two degrees Celsius of warming. Of course, we're already between one and two, we're about 1.2 degrees right now. Uh, and this is the work they were looking at. They don't have to minimize this uh, window fully now, seeing Laura there. Okay. Uh, this, this is from Stefan's paper, having tried to quantify what uh, level of temperature change will trigger all these major elements of the, of the uh, uh, globe's climate and then down here the, the analogy that uh, that Stefan is making here is that we're on a trajectory which is taking us towards a precipice but once we fall over two degrees we could fall into a much higher level that the forces unleashed in going past two degrees could be so great that we get pushed into a hothouse earth from which there is at least under our control there is no escape so the bottom line from scientists is catastrophic damages are likely if we approach two degrees we should be doing everything we can to avoid uh, even 1.5 and of course this is a huge divide between what economists are saying and what scientists are saying and we're finally getting them both groups to to notice it so Linton and Siskar wrote this back in 2013 and said you know very frankly there is a huge gulf between natural scientists' understanding of climate tipping points and how they're represented in economists' IACs. 
Uh, tipping points cannot be ruled out at low temperatures, less than two degrees, but the dominant framing in economics IAM is that they're associated with high or very high global warming up to eight degree levels. And, and Stern and Stiglitz have just come out with a working paper saying the overwhelming consensus in the scientific community differs so markedly from IAMs. And this, this shows the extent to which economists, even the critics, as Stern and Stiglitz are now turning out to be, don't read the literature of climate scientists. They could answer this question themselves if they read Lenton. Uh, is it sloppy thinking by the international community and the scientists uh, to irrationally embrace a goal involving excessive costs from the perspective of a hard-headed analysis of society welfare maximisation? Or is it that IMs have left something out or many things out of their analysis? Now, categorically, it's the latter. The only people who would dispute this are economists. And frankly, anybody who disputes this, I'm going to dispute right back. The work is dreadful. How on earth did economists conclude that a three to six degree increase in temperature on the planet would have such trivial effects? Well, what, I've, what I'm seeing is that you effectively have these highly complicated, very sophisticated econometric studies built on data, which might as well be quicksand. And frankly, something uh, that smells worse than quicksand is a more likely one. Uh, and the latest example is this paper by Dietz, Rising, Sturk, and much to my amazement and, dis and disappointment, of Gono uh, Wagner, Economic Impacts of Tipping Points in the Climate System, published by P uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, so a very prestigious journal. And they concluded that tipping points will reduce global consumption by, as I mentioned earlier, by around 1.4% upon six degrees of warming. Now, the tipping points they looked at were the Arctic summer sea ice, which I think we're all pretty aware is, is on its way to extinction, Greenland, West Antarctic, the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation, which is colloquially known as the Gulf Stream, the Amazon rainforest, the Indian monsoon, permafrost, and finally, ocean, me ocean methane hydrates. Now, when you look at this on Stefan's map of the hothouse earth, this is what they're the economists are saying will go and if they go, will cause only a 1.4% fall in GDP compared to what it would be in the complete absence of climate change. And you'll notice the only thing that's not on that list is methane hydrates. That's because scientists didn't expect them to dip before 2100. So the situation economists are looking at is more extreme than what scientists themselves think is likely to happen. And yet they are saying at all it causes a 1.4% fall in GDP. Now, how on earth, again, how on earth does this happen? What's, what's the logic? Well, for a start, just to get a, a, a scale, having said that six degrees of temperature increase will cause an 8% fall in GDP, which is Nordhaus in 2018, what Dietz and co have concluded by including tipping points in that, which was not part of Nordhaus's analysis, including the tipping points, they have even less impact than global warming on its own. So the sheets mentioned that a two degree warming in the absence of tipping points corresponds to 2.3 Celsius in the presence of tipping points. So all tipping points will do is increase global temperature. If it's uh, up by two degrees, it'll make it 2.3, yeah, fairly small. And this doesn't smell, it stinks to high heaven. There's got to be madness in their methods. And I'm going to, again, Robert Sol is my go-to person in mainstream economics for a fabulous quote. And he was, he's been a critic of DSGE models and real business cycle models for 20 something years. This is him being interviewed by Arjo Klama in conversations with economists. He said, suppose someone announces to me that he is Napoleon Bonaparte. The last thing I want to do is get involved in the technical discussion of cavalry, uh, cavalry tactics of the Battle of Austerlitz. If I do that, I'm getting tacitly drawn into the game that he is Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, unfortunately, economists are regarded as the equivalent of the little corporal in terms of strategy by politicians. So we have to talk about the cavalry tactics and see how the hell they got these results. And what Dietz and all did was they surveyed works by economists only on the impact of climate change. Now, logic was, well, climate scientists have talked about it, all these things, you know, we haven't mentioned them so far. Um, so we have to provide a unified estimate of the, of the estimate in this paper of the economic impacts of all eight climate tipping points covered in the economic literature. And those are the eight that I listed beforehand. We review this literature, they're just looking at what economists have written, and they found 52 papers that modeled at least one climate change tipping point. 
Now, they did admit one weakness of their analysis, and that is that they didn't include non-market impacts of climate change, such as damage to the ecosystem and human health. So oh, that's okay. They took a precaution, and the precaution was they included an estimate of those in their sensitivity analysis. So as a double check on what they did by looking at the actual tipping points, they also included this study of the impact on ecosystems uh, to say, well, did we get similar results? And how did they do it? Well, their sensitivity analysis used the idea of willingness to pay. And this is used to quantify damages to the environment. Uh, and the idea is that you ask people how much are they willing to pay to preserve an element of the climate. And that in fact, that you put an actual numerical value on, on the climate, on the uh, ecosystem itself, and also an estimate of the damages in a quantitative sense. Now, it's, this is used, for example, if you have a uh, let's say someone in Oxford, what, you've got a, a nature reserve somewhere in Oxford that a uh, commercial entity wants to build an amusement park on the same land, where you, you value the nature reserve, which is currently free, by getting people to say, what are you willing to pay? And if their willingness to pay is less than the commercial amusement park, goodbye nature reserve. That's the sort of moderately unobjectionable use to what it's put. But they use this to put damages on the global environment. And how did they do it? Well. They didn't do it themselves. They borrowed, and this is what happens all the way through economic literature, find something previously which you can slot in and call your estimates of this particular facet. So they used the non-market damage module of the merge IAM, and they cited MAN in 2005, but in fact, MAN's function, the number, the parameters and the function they're using go right back to 1995. So just, just as an aside, I had a paper rejected criti criticizing the stuff from the Royal Society a short while ago. And one of the bases was, we've moved on from that. Our stuff is so much more sophisticated these days. Here's a paper in, 1990, in 2021, basing itself unmodified on work in 1995. And this happens all the time. Uh, so this is well before economists started considering tipping points. So how on earth can you use a pre-tipping point paper as, a, as a, a sensitivity check on your analysis of tipping points? Well, it gets worse. Uh, they praised Merge's method and said Merge places particular emphasis on the representation of non-market uh, damages. Well, that's good. And they then say, while the parameters of the Merge non-market damages are speculative. Now, I am a, you know, this is, I've dedicated, very unfortunately, a lot of my life to saying, where is the nonsense in this in this edifice? Where's the weakness? So as soon as I saw the word speculative, I thought, aha, uh -huh, what does that mean? So I went back and took a look. It means that man at all made up the numbers. They're invented numbers. There is no survey. The usual thing for a willingness to pay is you do something like a survey or you have some sophisticated mathematical technique to pull out what the value might be out of, out of uh, economic data. They simply assumed that the willingness to pay to avoid a 2.5 degree increase in temperature in terms of its impact upon non-market goods, so on the environment, was 2% of GDP. And therefore, effectively, that 2.5 degrees increase in temperature would damage the environment by 2%. And they also assumed, again, without any logic behind it whatsoever, that damages were quadratic. Now, um, and this is, how, this is the way it was, this is, I'm going back to the Merge paper in 1995. Few issues have more challenging or engendered more controversy. True. What value do we place on biodiversity, environmental quality, human health? Important questions. And so we take an approach, take balance and willingness to pay how much your consumers are willing to pay to avoid the ecological damages. This was done on a, on a country by country basis as well, which I'm not going into here. I think that's a little, uh, it made it look more sophisticated, basically. I said the fraction of, of uh, willingness to pay depends upon both temperature change and GDP per capita. But for non-market damages, we have the assumption so that, it, that consumers would be willing to pay 2% of GDP to avoid ecological damages associated with a 2.5 temperature increase. And the justification for the assumption, what are the, how do they justify simply assuming that? Well, as a point of reference, this is looking at data from, this is published in 95, but it's looking at data published in 93, which was based on data in 1992. As a point of reference, the USA currently devotes approximately 2% of its gross domestic product to all forms of environmental protection, hence the 2% figure. Now, what it also did was assume that damages are quadratic. And why? Because it's easy. 
no other reason. If damage change, damages change quadratically with temperature, the calibration of the function requires only a single point on each function, the market and the non-market. That's the reason they used a quadratic. Because once you presume a, a pure quadratic, quadratic describes the damages, then all you need is one intercept and you've worked out the quadratic. So if you combine the assumption of a willingness to pay 2.5 uh, Celsius equals 2% of GDP with a quadratic, what you get is that the damages, uh, the environment won't be completely destroyed until temperatures risen by 17.68 degrees Celsius. Again, wonderful flow of precision there. So here it is. There's, there's the damage function, and there's the, uh, the intercept they use, which therefore means the part of the environment still hangs on until temperatures risen by 17.68 degrees Celsius. And the function is 0 0.0032 times the change in temperature squared. This is being used to calibrate tipping points, just to remind you of that absurdity. Now, this was regurgitated. I'm going to use some pretty aggressive words in this thing. This, this is thrown up again by Dietz. And here's the statement. Delta T cat is a catastrophic warming parameter set to 17.68 degrees Celsius. And again, they admit it, derived from the assumption that economic losses, losses rise quadratically. This is in measuring tipping points and a calibrated, ha, huh, to a loss of 2% of GDP at 2.5 degrees warming. So something which should have been chucked out of the, the, the cannon from 20 years earlier is revived, un un unmodified, in a paper supposedly talking about tipping points. So you know, how can you do this? What is going on that economists do this sort of stuff? You're using a pre-tipping point model where you assume damage is a quadratic and doing a sensitivity check, ha ha, on your estimates of the impact of tipping points. Now a hint, why do they do it? It's because they're this guy, okay? These are madmen, frankly. And they've got perfectly sane in their own right, but it's been sent mad by the analytic framework they use. So let's look at this Napoleonic assumption, and I mean a person who thinks he's Napoleon, rather than actual Napoleon, of a 2.5 degree temperature increase, uh, meaning a 2% damage to GDP. Uh, here, this, this is the, 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 to the, the environment. And this is the, the point of reference, devote 2% to its uh, all forms of environmental protection. Well, that's just, that, that's where the prediction comes from, this 17.68 degree temperature. You know, just to repeat that little bit. But all they're doing is they're using the GD, percentage of GDP devoted to environmental protection from 1992. Well, why not use the change in temperature from when they wrote the paper, it was published in 95 as well. And the delta T then was roughly, I'm not going to be bothered to do precise because this is so crazy anyway, uh, but roughly it was about half a degree. Okay, so let's now know that's our coordinate. Rather than using 2.5 and 2%, we should be using 0 0.5 and 2%. Well, the quadratic for that, yeah, there it is. Rather than 0 0.0032, it's 0 0.08. Now, if you run that through, amusingly enough, what you get is a temperature level at which the environment is completely destroyed that is pretty much close to what scientists themselves would accept. Now, the function is still crazy, but the number coming out of it is closer to reality that scientists are trying to warn us about. Um, but, you know, again, a quadratic. Uh, it doesn't have a tipping point. Okay, a tipping point by definition involves an acceleration of the rate of change at some point. Uh, the, 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 the second derivative of a, of a quadratic is, is, a, is, a, is a constant. So let's use the logistic instead. It's still pretty silly, but at least it's got some sort of change in its uh, derivatives at various points. So this is a, the, the blue line there is, uh, let's go through them. The red line is what Dietz and Co actually used. And there we are, four degrees of temperature increase. That's probably a one or so degree, one or two percent fall in GDP. The blue line is, is what I'm saying they should have given us if they'd actually used the two data points they had from 1995, not just one. Here's the logistic calibrated to the same you know, catastrophic level. So by 3.5 degrees Celsius, you have no, no, no ecology left. And this is the slope of that function, which is peaking, as you can see, at two degrees, which is the warning that science has given us, you know, don't go there. It's still simplistic, but it's closer to what we can actually expect in terms of tipping points. And it carries the implicit warning, don't let this thing get too much momentum. And we'd be best to stop well short 
of a temperature increase of one and a half degrees Celsius. But no, they gave us a quadratic and they gave us this quadratic, which virtually looks like a straight line in all the temperatures that are relevant to the extinction, potential extinction of human civilization. So not only are they doing that with this, the, the, this, the things they didn't measure, so this is not looking at papers on tipping points. When they do tipping points, uh, they use people who themselves clearly do not understand what climate change is. This is Antoff Estrada and one of my favourite people on the whole planet, Richard Toll, shutting down the thermohyaline circulation. Now that is, I mean, imagine most people who would know what that is, but this is for those who don't. It's a huge oceanic current and it's driven by differences in both temperature and, and salt levels. And the AMOC is the part that carries uh, the temperature, uh, hot, uh, warm water from the uh, equatorial levels of the Atlantic up to the northern sections of the Atlantic, which is what makes Europe as warm as it is. Those plants you've got behind you, Laura, uh, may have to be uh, something a bit, uh, without the AMOC, they'd be something rather more suited to freezing temperatures. So there's the AMOC section of the, um, of the, uh, of the uh, overall thermohyaline solution. Now, if the AMOC breaks down, there'll be no change in global temperature. It's just a distribution system for heat from the equator to the uh, northern, north of the northern hemisphere. But you would have a hotter equator because more of that heat would accumulate around the Caribbean level and you would get cooling of, uh, of Europe. And to give you an idea of the scale of it, this is from Hansen in 2016, maybe in 2015 actually, uh, cooling of three degrees in summer and five to 10 in winter. So, you know, that means lots more, um, um, skiing, so that's going to be good for the economy, isn't it? And I'm not joking, that's pretty much the standard of what uh, Toll and Friends did. Now, if, when you look at what the scientists say would happen with this, if you have that, that cooling, then of course you're going to have a, a larger temperature gradient between the equator and the northern, the north of the uh, Atlantic. And that will mean, as, they were just looking at a two degree temperature change here. So we're talking far less than what's been discussed by Dietz and Co. That means about a, a 10 to 20% increase in the strength of winds. And that means the power goes up by 1.4 to two because the power is proportional to the cube of the wind speed. And the stronger temperature gradient provides energy for more severe weather events, popularly known as superstorms. That's what we can expect if the AMOC goes. Now, recent evidence, uh, Boers in 21, 2021, found that it is evidence of it slowing down. And this is taking climate scientists to some extent by surprise because they thought it wouldn't happen until we got into uh, the next the next century and possibly a three degree increase in temperature. But it seems to be happening much more rapidly than that. Richard Toll's reaction to that was good. Here's the report. And there's Toll, simply good. And why does he reckon it's good? Well, it's because of this paper that he wrote. And this is the paper that Dietz and Co used, the only paper they used to assess the impact of losing the AMOC. Uh, and all they did was consider, of course, there's the, the, the important point I mentioned just by mentioning some of the parts in, in Hansen's paper on this, is that there's numerous effects, the temperature gradient, the increase in moisture levels, this, the wind strength and so on. Uh, all they considered was the temperature change. They didn't look at interactions. They didn't look at any other climate effects such as precipitation. So they said, we just use the annual temperature as an indicator of the severity of climate change. Uh, and the impact depends on whether it pushes a country towards or away from its optimum. And with the temperatures they are assuming, uh, the, the, the cooling down is going to therefore be positive for Europe. Okay. And if it slows down a little, the Bennett is was two to 3%, it becomes 1.3% for a more pronounced slowdown. So getting rid of that part of the climate will make the economy better. Hence, Richard Toll thinks it's good. And of course, even better, by the time you get to 2085, which is when they thought that was happening in their model, um, people would be much wealthier, so you wouldn't worry about climate change all that much anyway. You know, what's wrong? A couple of hundred mile an hour storms in, uh, in, in Europe, who cares? We're much wealthier, we can cope with it. Uh, this is ignorant drivel. There's no point being polite about this. This is garbage. And here we have, yet it is regurgitated by Dietz, and they say that it will reduce the social cost of carbon by reducing damaging warming in some countries. And they also, another one of the studies they used said the same thing about the Arctic, losing the summer sea ice will be a good thing. So here are the, 
there are eight levels and assess through the social cost of carbon rather than change in GDP. And both of these are shown of negative, reducing the social cost of carbon, therefore improving the economy. Economists are playing God in redesigning a climate system they do not understand. And this is what's going on here. So the empirical work in, in general, and this is just the latest example. I, I've, done, I've started from here because, you know, I got annoyed, frankly, very annoyed uh, to be told that oh, we're, my papers, you know, using old stuff, we've moved on from that. Yeah, you've moved on and you've dragged the past with you. You shouldn't have using any of this stuff. It should just be thrown out. Now, if you look at the empirical data, so-called, that all these IMs have been fitted to, here's, this is the sort of stuff they do. This is Nordhaus in 1991, setting the scenes for doing an adding up approach, uh, adding up uh, damages in different industries, and then saying that's what's going to happen from climate change. So, well, there are some things which are exposed to the weather, others which are take place in carefully controlled environments that won't be affected. And that the latter group is 87% of industry for the bulk of the economy, manufacturing, mining, utilities, finance, trade, and most service industries, it is difficult to find major direct impacts of climate changes for the next 50 to 75 years. That's absurd, okay? We should have got rid of it, but this is again, turning up in the IPCC report. A frequently asked question, other activities such as manufacturing and services take place in controlled environments and are not really exposed to climate change. They have mistaken climate for the weather. This is Nordhaus's table five. I just want to keep on hammering it because it's so bad that it should never have been published. Okay. But it's, it's set style and it's, it's the basis of everything that's been published since. So here are the industries that he reckons are going to be unaffected, 87% of GDP. The only thing those industries have in common is they take either indoor, take place either indoors or underground. So he's mistaking the weather for the climate. And that has been the style of all the papers published ever since. Equally, they mistake space for time. This is this when this was the first statement when I first read this, this is when I realized what what a disaster we were dealing with in terms of the neoclassical economics of climate change. I was in shock when I first read this line. It was so obviously stupid to me. It's insane. What they're saying is you can use current data on GDP and temperature to predict the impact of climate change. Now, Toll can dress it up very nicely, but if you think about, if you wanted to make an econometric study to say, what are the impacts of temperature on climate change, given the different factors that can cause temperature, one is solar cycles and how far we are from the sun. Of course, that's irrelevant. The second is solar energy retention, courtesy of more greenhouse gases, and that's the issue at hand in global warming. And the third is how far you are from the equator or oceans or above sea level, and that's irrelevant to global warming. Now, what they've done in this so-called cross-sectional approach is drive parameters for the third factor and use those same parameters for the second. It's simply insane. As fancy as the mathematics might be and the econometrics and so on, it's nonsense to do that. Um, it's like having a detailed map of a mountain in a north-south direction and then advising on the safety of crossing it east-west in the dark. But that's fundamentally what we're doing. Um, I want to just give a little illustration of this. This is uh, just as a mock-up to show what the hell they did. This took me about half an hour. This is temperature deviation with the new United States average temperature on the um, horizontal and de deviation of per capita gross state product on the vertical. And if you, you know, you can see there's almost no correlation, but you can, you can whack a quadratic in there. It's got a moderate correlation of 0 0.31 with the data. And the, the coefficient for that quadratic is minus 0 0.00318 times temperature squared. That's larger than the coefficient that NICE is, that Nordhaus is using. That's, I'm using the six degree temperature prediction here. That's DICE's prediction. This mock-up, this silly thing I did in about half an hour, gives a more extreme prediction than is used in DICE. Now, this is implying a trivial impact on GDP, and it's supporting global warming deniers and trivialisers like Bjorn Lomborg. Now, this is Lomborg having a go at the Extinction Rebellion kids and saying, look, you know, it's silly. Clear climate change is a problem, but it's not a destroyer of the future. Its total cost is equivalent to 2, .2 to 4% of GDP by 2100. Here, from Nobel Climate Economist, update of IPCCC. Now, ask yourselves, how on earth are economists helping humanity with climate change when what they're doing is giving climate change denialists like Lomborg talking points?
There's something seriously wrong with this discipline. And when they do read the research, they distort it. I was stunned by this as well. Uh, I, again, I've never, I've, I've been reading and criticizing neoclassical economics for 50 years. This is the worst work by far that I've seen in that 50 year period. So here is a, a paper, a, a table by Lenton uh, assessing, it'd be very, he said very quick and quick and dirty, he called it um, uh, exposure analysis. And these key conclusions are saying, first of all, you shouldn't use smooth functions for climate change. The Arctic is likely to tip, and along with greenhouse, greenhand as well, and we've already, it, it's, we may have already tipped. So this is, this is a paper saying we've already had a tipping point, don't use smooth functions, and you know, we're already in the danger zone. And how does Nordhaus summarise this? Have a look. How the hell did he get that out of Lenton's paper, saying it, nothing to worry about now we've got three degrees and nothing to worry about for three centuries. No critical tipping elements with a time horizon of less than 300 years until temperatures increase by at least three degrees Celsius. So that's why, and, and again, everything Nordhaus says dominates the rest of the um, cabal around him. And the manual for dice, he actually quotes, and this is where I first realised it, uh, he quotes Lenton to support using a quadratic. I mean, if one of my students submitted this, I'd fail him. If he insisted a bit more rigorously about it, I'd cuck him out of the course. I wouldn't give him a Nobel Prize, but this is what turns, happens in economics. So why do economists do this? What on earth is going on? And the basic answer is there are fundamentally global warming deniers. I don't remember denying it's happening but they deny that it really matters. And I think this comes out of the mentality that neoclassical economics gives you, that capitalism can cope with anything, and therefore nothing can be an existential threat to capitalism, therefore global warming can't be a problem. And this is some of the, the literature, um, Nordhaus in 1991. Human societies thrive in a wide variety of climatic zones. For the bulk of economic activity, non-climate variables swamp climatic considerations. That's looking at today's climate, not changing it through global warming. Uh, in 94, he did a, a survey of so-called experts. One of them is Larry Summers, I might add. Uh, for most experts, the three degrees warming would be small potatoes. I'm sure that's Larry. And it's equally here. It takes a very sharp pencil to see the difference between a world with and without climate change and with and without mitigation. Uh, and then there were two, there were 19 people surveyed in this thing, three scientists amongst the 19, the rest were economists, engineers, and uh, one or two engineers. Two of the three scientists answered Nordhaus's questions, one refused, and the average of those two was 20 to 30 times what the mainstream economists had to say. And then again, his toll, his errands put up as the main author, but I'm sure toll wrote most of it. The impact of climate change will be small. Medium evidence, high agreement. Okay. So denialism, this, this is an overall denialism about climate change, but I only go deeper and say it actually lies in how economists think about production as well, because these days the dominant model is the Cobb-Douglas production function. You get some people using the uh, ones that, you know, I've forgotten the other term right now, but it, far and away the dominant model is, is, is Cobb-Douglas. Now I'm going to quote Larry favourably here, which is a bit of a shock, but I'll do it. Um, he's talking about why economists didn't see the financial crisis coming. He made the analogy to a power failure. And he said, now, if you had a power failure, there'd be a bunch of economists who'd explain that electricity was only 4% of the economy. And so if you lost 80% of electricity, you couldn't possibly lose more than 3% of the economy. And he got a good laugh for it and said, there'd be people in Minnesota and Chicago writing it, but it would be stupid. Uh, we'd understand somehow, even if we didn't exactly understand in the model, that when there wasn't any electricity, there really wasn't going to be much economy. So I'm going to help our Larry out here and explain why he's right in the model itself. What's wrong with the model? Well, the standard model, of course, ignores energy. You have the Cobb-Douglas production function. I'm sure that's familiar to quite a few people here, but that basically says output is technology represented by the A, which grows exponentially over time, multiplied by capital raised to the alpha times labor to the one minus alpha. So you get constant returns to scale. And the exponent alpha is based on the share of GDP. So since capitalists get about 30% of GDP and workers about 70%, alpha is set to 0 0.3. Now, when the limits to growth was published, a set of economists published papers where they finally 
uh, included resources, but only very temporarily. It didn't become a, anything con con continuing in that. But Erkstrom used the same approach. You basically tack energy on as a third factor of production, independent factor of production like that. And how do you choose the the new the um, coefficient for it? Same story. You base it on the share of energy and GDP. And they this particular paper set it to 0 0.03, which is what most neoclassical economists would do if they were caught cold and asked how to bring it in. Uh, now, I had a little insight back in 2016 that I literally came in that saying into my mind walking through a friend's house, Bob Ayers as it happens, the uh, uh, physicist who's been trying to bring uh, economic ecology and, um, uh, into, e into economics for the last 40 or 50 years. Labor with that energy is a corpse. Capital with that energy is a sculpture. So the correct way to handle energy is not to treat it as an independent factor of production, but to treat it as an essential input into both capital and labor without which they can't perform work. So I make that substitution. I, rather than having L, I've got L of E, and that's the number of workers times the energy uh, input per worker, which in our case is tens of thousands of watts in terms of the amount of energy we consume as modern day humans in modern day society, multiplied by the efficiency with all of that energy is converted into useful work. And the same thing for machines. Now, if you look at the energy we consume times how much of that actually turns up as work, the maximum you can sustain at that sense is about 100 watts an hour. It hasn't changed since the days of Roman slaves. Whereas the energy input to a machine has risen exponentially since James Watt. The James Watt steam engine burnt about nine tons of coal per day. Uh, Elon Musk's uh, Falcon uh, rocket burns about nine tons of kerosene per second. Uh, so this, when you put the mathematics through, this is the result you get. Your output is now uh, the constant for labor times e, the energy throughput for a machine times capital raised to alpha times labor raised to one minus alpha. So alpha replaces new as the exponent of energy and alpha in this case is 10 times new. So the impact as a result of that is the standard model drastically understates the impact of energy. When you bring this in, you find a far different result. Now take Larry's example. If you do the standard factor of production treatment, then an 80% fall in electricity, and this is where his Minnesota friends would come in, the prediction would be a 5% fall in GDP. Trivial, you substitute labor for capital. Labor and capital for energy, no big deal. The substitution fallacy. But if you use my approach, energy is an input in the treatment of, of energy, you get a 38% fall in GDP because there is no substitute for energy. Okay. If you don't have petrol in your car, you can't put, uh, oh, what, M&Ms inside there again and have the car run. So the result is there's a drastic understatement of the level of damages to the, to the uh, economy from a drop in energy, but that's still not enough. Uh, and there's a paper, I'm, again, I don't, I'm not used to complimenting ManQ, but there's two very good papers he wrote back in the, in the 90s saying that when you look at cross-country data rather than within a single country, the exponent for K has to be at least twice as high as is commonplace in the literature. So he said the, Cobb, the, the Solo and cobb Douglas model correctly predicts the direction of the impact of savings and population growth, but it doesn't get the magnitudes right. Um, because the usual thing is we put a coefficient roughly equal to one third, but he said the estimates imply that alpha is much higher uh, and the sample he used, one part of the sample, it was 0.59. And therefore the, the, the empirical data strongly contradicts the use of alpha equal to 0.3 in a Cobb-Douglas production function. And he said there's a number of problems that come out for the neoclassical model of growth in this cross-country comparisons. They are all removed if you have the capital share equal to 0.8. Not 0 0.3, 0 0.8. What happens if you do that? Well, put alpha at 0 0.8 inside there, and what you find is your prediction is not uh, a you know a 40% fall. It's a 72% fall. If energy fell by 80%, we'd have a 72% fall in energy. This is serious. In other words, this is the stuff that Nordhaus couldn't see how there could be an impact from climate change on manufacturing. This is why Lara is right. Okay, there'd be no. And this is what economists and the politicians who listen to them think implicitly is going to happen if we had to lose 80% of our energy supply. This is what actually would happen. That much of a fall in output would happen. And it's even stronger than I'm showing there because the Cobb-Douglas doesn't do it justice. When you take a look at the, first of all, when you take a look at the level of output we currently have, um, 
uh, energy inputs to produce that output. Uh, renewables and nuclear have been below 14% of GDP way back since the 1970s. If you extrapolate the trend from 2013 forward, you might get to 20% now. Uh, but what's going to happen if we have a fall in, in energy, if we have to just use renewables, uh, then with the fact that the relationship is virtually linear, if we have an 80% fall in energy input, we'll have an 80% fall in GDP. Now, as I've said, there's nothing worth saving in this literature. It should just be terminated. And I'd be happy to have Arne Schwarzenegger do it. Leave the measurement to the scientists. This is a sunk cost. Throw it away. There's nothing worth saving in this literature. Instead, if we're going to have economists being useful, they should accept what scientists tell us that 1.5 to 2 degrees is absolute maximum we should allow and try to work out how to actually finance it. Now, of course, you can't turn to mainstream economists about how to finance climate change and mitigation because they don't understand money. So this is where modern monetary theory comes in. Uh, the insight that Bar Barnes and Rummel had back in the, after the Second World War, that government deficits create money and reserves. We've seen evidence of that during the COVID crisis. Uh, there's been a dramatic increase in savings. Why? Because there's been a dramatic increase in the government deficit. Uh, the, the, and there's no problem about selling the bonds. I, don't, I won't go into explaining this here, but the basic idea is a deficit creates money and reserves. The reserves, so, uh, the buying of bonds is an asset swap from reserves by the banking sector. And if the bonds are sold to the public or to the non-bank financial sector, that reduces spending power. So it's straightforward to finance this by deficit, by deficit spending. And this is what Barnsley, uh, Beasley Rummel said back in 1996, 19, 1946, taxes for revenue are obsolete. We've learned that lesson through COVID. Let it be one thing we learn to apply to climate change when we've got to put all our resources towards climate change. Secondly, we have to start thinking in terms of resource depletion and again, thinking in terms of aggregate production functions that don't even have inputs from the other industries, let alone from the, from the natural world. It's blinded us to resource depletion. And I'm now we're using work of a, another Australian actually is an Australian mining engineer called the Mining of Minerals and the Limits to Growth. Simon Muncher based in, in, in Finland, highly recommend you invite him for the seminar series, Laura, he's, he's excellent. Uh, what you, when you look at the, the periodic table and say what elements are, are in trouble, then those four elements, helium, zinc, uh, neomidium, which is necessary for batteries these days, and helium, are in critical undersupply already. Phosphorus is threatened and life can't exist without phosphorus. I don't know how many of the economists realise that, but if you don't have phosphorus, you better evolve into another species because there's no way to get energy through your system to stay alive. And these are all ones which are vital for existing technologies, including lithium, and already uh, in limited availability. Uh, so we, are, we have hit the limits to growth. What Nordhaus said was a, a dangerous model and a, a fallacy. We're already on the border of it. So we have to find ways to shift to using technologies using the green rather than the orange or red uh, elements there. Um, and we, we have to also uh, realise the, the importance of the energy relationship, again, to emphasise that that's world energy versus world GDP over the last 50 years. That's the correlation of change in energy with change in GDP. So we have a de we, decoupling is a pipe dream. Stop reciting it. I've seen too much nonsense on that front from economists already. Uh, with fossil fuels at 85% of energy generation, maybe 80% if we're lucky, we need rapid non-carbon energy transition. We need government's support to do that. Uh, and we also need to reduce consumption. I think with no, we've, we've, we've gone past what's sustainable on this planet. So we have to ration and go backwards. And a proposal I'm working on is related to the idea of tradable uh, carbon credits uh, I'm, I'm, I think I've just extended that idea to say we should actually have universal carbon credits allocated on a per capita basis. And you could start with them equal to the national average consumption. Given how skewed the um, distribution of income is, the wealthy 5% would be the ones who run out of UCCs, but 95% of the population would have excess UCCs. So you would have a very politically attractive for a change policy, whereas carbon taxes, of course, lead to revolts like the Gilets jaunes. So you'd be politically popular, that would benefit the majority. The market would set the price, not economists, whose work on that is a total waste of time. <clears throat> and there'd be pressure on the rich 
to buy and develop low carbon dioxide goods and energy sources. And if things really get bad, it would be a way to ration, a bit like we did rationing during the Second World War. So this is a website which I didn't develop and I'm associated with the person who's put it together um, on carbon rationing. I do recommend you take a look at it. That's the website there. So conclusion, uh, we have mainstream economists have dominated our decision making about climate and they've negligently, this is incredible negligence to do this to such an important topic and drastically underestimated the damages we face. So as a result, we've delayed action for 50 years. It's far too late now to rely upon market mechanisms or carbon taxes to inspire the private sector to do their mitigation as rapidly as is necessary. And maybe adaptation is impossible even at one and a half degrees of warming, given what we're likely to lose the level of warming. The forces we're talking about unleashing here are greater than humanity can address. The level of energy alone in the AMOC is just you know, dwarfs what humanity itself uses. We'll need a wartime mobilization and rationing if the tipping points start to cascade. And the only way the economists could help is by working out the financing and rationing methods. But in terms of the mainstream economists have done this, Nordhaus, Toll, Mendelssohn, Dietz, Wagner, and all the rest, they should be excluded from future policy advice. Their models should be excluded and the work they've done should be thrown out. Thank you, I'll leave it at that. Well, thank you very much, uh, Steve. Um, that was very strong language. We are not used, you know, in academic debate to have this kind of level of polemics, um, but this is something that we need to take into account, you know, um, mm. and I will, um, I think passions are raising with the issues, um, but we also can have a, a, a very fruitful academic debate with all the important numbers and figures that you have given us. Uh, Professor Vines, would you want to come and give your comments? Thank you very much. Um, first of all, could you just tell me how long you would like me to talk for because um five minutes each i know i mean it's not very long but you can come back in the q a maybe <laughs> certainly uh, how we should re-invite you for a special side event <laughs> <laughs> how long is a piece of string mm. um, <laughs> thank you very much steve um really thought-provoking uh talk and uh a lot of details in this talk uh, were uh, new to me and very interesting. Um, this is a difficult subject and there's a lot of dispute. Um, that lecture to me today, there were too many moving parts. Yeah, fair enough. And I want to try and uh, suggest coming from the world that I live in, which parts really matter so that I, I will say some very critical things, but I think it's going to end up being a, a constructive advice. <laughs> so let me hope that you think of uh, what I say in that spirit. Um, I think the trouble with economists is basically that they're not very good at mathematics. Uh, th and what I mean by that is roughly this, that the essential insights of the DSG model are ones derived from a linear system. The first order conditions in DSG model are uh, linear and the objective functions are quadratic. Uh, sorry, the equations are linear and the objective functions quadratic, first order conditions linear. Uh, right back to Samuelson, uh, that the only way you can do intelligible stuff is to have a model when you poke something, you know what comes out the other end, and a linear model gives you that because there are never multiple equilibria in such a model. That's, that's ever since Samuelson, actually it goes back to Marshall. Um, it seems to me that uh, much of your criticism uh, is a bit wide of the mark, uh, it, that's the problem that I think we face. Your central part of your talk 
produced a, a very large number of important nonlinearities. Uh, the visual memory of your talk that I take away from is that logistic curve. When you try and stick logistic curves into structures that look really quite like DSG models, you can begin to go a long way. This kind of approach to macro modeling is uh, something which I've been pushing. I uh, edited an issue of Oxford Review of Economic Policy, came out um, just uh, at Christmas time. And this, if you want a, a, a popular uh, vision of the agenda, you could type um, DSGE model, Eric Beinhocker, who's here in Oxford, David Vines into Google. Beinhocker interviewed me about this issue of, of, of Oxrep, and it's a fun interview. I, it, I think he and I both had fun discussing this really pushing the multiple equilibrium uh, story. Um, and, and lots of it, I'm gonna go back and listen carefully to the evidence that you presented in, in, the, in the middle of your talk. The enemy there was the quadratic story with linear first order conditions. The simple, uh, mental thing to focus on lo was logistic with really steep slope in the middle. Uh, what does that do? It gives you in a model which is in all sorts of ways familiar, two regimes. The good world that we're in at the moment, you get onto the logistic steeply rising stuff and the model moves into a new regime in which there's another very bad equilibrium. Um, now, <clears throat> that's what I took from the middle of your talk. Thank you very much. What to do about it? I'm afraid I didn't find anything of what you said at all persuasive. Um, of course, the Cobb-Douglas production function story is stupid. And I admire the way that you've stuck energy complementary to capital into that in order to get a proper exponent on energy in the production function. But that proposal that you put forward uh, bore no relation whatsoever to the, because of Cobb-Douglas linear first order conditions, it, it bore no relationship whatsoever to the really important empirical stuff that you described in the middle of the uh, lecture. Uh, so more work to be done by you, me, everybody, on what to do next. And actually, I think I know some of what to do. Uh, but can I play, take a plea here to keep monetary, modern monetary theory out of this stuff? It doesn't belong anywhere near here. And actually, it's a nuisance in, com in conversations of this kind. Uh, so let's go on to finally, quickly, how you need to think about this. And everyone will recognize me as someone stuck in the middle between critics like Steve and the old fashioned, it's quite odd in politics, it's quite hard to be a, criti a, a critical when you find that the big noise is being made by people who end up saying, you're not critical enough, David. <laughs> Come on, move over, to, uh, move over to the noisy world and make, here's me in the middle. I would start, with something very like a Ramsey model, but I would put into it, and, and, and um, Rick van der Plerg and a student of his, Hannah Roma, are working on precisely this in a way, in Oxford at the minute, in a way which I think is very interesting. Uh, Ramsey model, all the orthodox DSG stuff, but product, what do you add to it? Production leads to emissions, emissions lead to temperature rise, Temperature rise leads to loss of output. And loss of, so the objective function is still good old fashioned economic growth stuff, more commodities, very conventional. But in that added set of equations, production leads to emissions, emission leads to temperature rise, temperature rise leads to loss of output. There is scope for really significant logistic nonlinearities. 
And I think the first task of the non-radicals like Steve, who are con like me, conventional uh, uh, critics of the conventional wisdom, is to understand how when you calibrate this addition to a standard Ramsey model, you can, I believe, th th this is conjecture because I haven't seen the outcome, I believe you can end up with the good world we live in going across a nonlinear tipping point to a very, very bad outcome. Now, let me say in the end, uh, why am I saying all this? Well, it's partly the history of who I am. I've been a teacher for many years, and I think that, and one of the points I made in the uh, Oxrep issue that we produced nine months ago, is that I think the world needs what Olivier Blanchard and I and others called toy models, ways that capture simply and clearly the issues at hand. And I just ask you, supposing in the first term macro course in the MPhil and economics here, after the Ramsey model had been presented, there was another two or three lectures which described the vulnerability of the whole global economic system in terms of these added three components, which I would add to the Ramsey model. All those people doing the MPhil in economics and going on to do graduate work would not do the kind of silly stuff that uh, Steve described. They get on with understanding how these non-linearities render the world and all of us to very great danger. But guess Thank what? You. Thank they'd you very much, Professor Vines. Can you look, just wrap up? <laughs> I'm stopping now. I'm just saying they would look to we would look people doing that would look to Steve like very conventional people, but they would be bringing the mainstream in a very radical direction. And I think that's where the work really needs to be done. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think it was silly of me to think that you would each speak for five minutes and <laughs> it would answer. So I think it's fairer to the debate, given that we have two open questions anyway, to give Steve a chance to respond to each of you. And like this, you can all, each of you, take the time to explain your arguments as well. These things are complex difficult and important, and we don't want to just do a superficial Q&A. Okay. Uh, Steve, what would you respond to sure. uh, David? Okay. Well, first of all, I completely agree with David that an economist is bad at mathematics. Uh, one of the things which, I, I, when I was a student rebel at Sydney University in 1971, I was studying mathematics at the same time. And most of the people were in, in, the, in the left and anti-neoclassical were also anti-mathematics. But I was dragged out when they wanted to hit somebody who said, oh, so you can't understand mathematics. Absolutely. You know, I mean, I, I used to entertain, you like this, David, I used to entertain myself on the quantitative methods uh, lectures by working out how many lines of working workings out had been jumped over by the lecturers. The average was seven steps. And I thought you guys can't understand this stuff, you're taking it on faith. So I completely agree there. Where I disagree uh, is the DSG model. They should go. And the thing is, I have a replacement, which you may be, do you know the Goodwin's model? You don't know, Dave? Okay. Take a look for Dave. Guess what? I was a PhD student of Goodwin's. I know his work very well. Oh, you do? Okay. 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 What yeah. I've done is I've built an energy-based version of Goodwin. Uh, which I did with uh, under the NIS uh, funding. So I'll quickly, this is obviously this is another topic altogether if I ever wanted to show this properly. But this is a Goodwin model modified to include energy as the input. And this is just again, as you said, it's a toy model. The toy model says as you use the energy, of course, you're depleting your reserves of energy up here. And this is just, you know, I could have many, I've got output and waste turning up there as well. I could have waste feeding back and producing productivity as well. But a kind of system that behaves just like the old Goodman model, which you, I'm glad you know very well, that fixed, you know, cycle going on indefinitely until you start to get, uh, and this is in this example I've done, this is just straight resource depletion. Now, I, I agree with the comment that the Stone Age didn't end because you ran out of stones. 
and the oil age won't end because you run out of oil. But if you run this on for long enough with this sort of setting up, you deplete, you run out of resources, output collapses, and you move away from that curve there. I'm obviously filling in time because I'm waiting for it to hit the, uh, I've set it up at this particular set of parameters. So uh, you could start from the time of Adam Smith uh, and have you know nothing going wrong, everything looks fabulous. And when you get closer and closer to where we are, which is roughly 250 years in the simulation, then the depletion starts to hit uh, you then have a reduction in your productivity because you're, you're going further and further to find those mineral resources and the extra cost means your productivity declines. You can see it starting to happen now in the, the phase, phase diagram there from wages versus employment share. Uh, you've still got waste rising, of course, because there's a delay. We've got carbon dioxide clay going in there as well. And then finally, I'm saying, whoops, everything looks so good for that first 250 years and then bang it's good night josephine to the economy so that is a, a very viable way to model uh, a toy model that is much much better intellectually than the um than uh, the dsge models and what i've also done uh, is is do what hicks tried to do back in 1935 if you know his paper uh, wages and interest the the dynamic problem he tried to build a model of a bread economy where every uh, week you had a red price decided on Monday, those prices applied until Friday. What he didn't include was how do you make the bread ovens? He didn't actually manage to get it done. The trouble was working with bread, it's very hard to work out what you can use as a, uh, as a, as a capital good. You know, how can you use stale bread to make new bread? So what I did was I realized let's invert the problem. Rather than having a realistic consumption good, an unrealistic, in fact, non-existent capital good. Let's have an unrealistic capital capital good, con consumption good, which is a realistic investment good. And that's the, I, I made this myth of the, the land of the iron giants. So you have irons who can eat, iron giants who can eat iron, who mine iron, who mine coal, et cetera, et cetera. And this is the beginning of a model which had not just energy in it, but capital as well. And that can be expanded. Too, to, yeah. too, too much detail. You didn't need the cycles in the Goodwin model. We can have this discussion offline. I want you to focus. The Goodwin model will produce what matters for your lecture. And someone ought to tell you to get rid of the cycles because they're not part of the story. Focus I disagree. I answer. disagree. And, and I'm going to go to the Forrester on that front and say that the, 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 the real dynamics of the economy, the, the short term dynamics cause the long term dynamics. So we're going to disagree on that one. And let's say I that understand that point. But the cycles that you showed in those simulations are not part of your final story. We've got to have this discussion offline. Too much detail. Please some focus. I think I can get there with the yes, focus well, anyway. Okay. Thank yep, you very time. much. It's wonderful to see um, economists debate with each other. Um, <laughs> in my discipline, anthropology, it happens all the time, so I'm quite used to this. But it's true that it's wonderful to see people in the same discipline trying to advance their discipline by having very fundamental discussions. So thank you so much for this exchange. Professor Sud, could you come? on now and give your comments to Steve. Thanks, Laura, and uh, thank you, Steve, for that um, provocative talk. I'm not an economist. I'm a historian by training. Uh, and by now, I'm completely undisciplined. I publish in geography and political science in development studies. So that's where I'm coming from uh, in these comments. I can totally understand your need to critique neoclassical economics and um, you know how uh, you know what what you're calling mainstream economists have um, you know led us on a on a very dangerous path with their number crunching their sort of ceteris paribus type of conditions and uh, how they have sort of made themselves fairly um, irrelevant to the debate that's happening in, you know, very vigorously in other social science disciplines. And you have sort of shown that very effectively. Um, in, in ODID, where this talk is being hosted, uh, we have known that for quite a while. So, you know, even before the climate change debate came to the fore, uh, people within development studies who are not economists, but also heterodox economists have been pushing to have key questions of our time debated from the perspective of different social science disciplines uh, in a multi and interdisciplinary way, to sort, of, sort of to dislodge 
the hegemony of economics in the way we look at development studies and development questions, and now increasingly at climate questions. So I can see the value of critiquing within economics, but I think the climate question is too important to just go on doing, you know, carrying out that debate. There's a whole world um, of debates and questions uh, that are well beyond. And I urge economists to, you know, move with the sort of memo. Um, so that would be one point. And uh, I think development studies in this department is perhaps, you know, one, one way of, you know, looking at this dialogue between different disciplines, etc. The second point I wanted to raise was maybe one of the reasons that these dangerous figures have been perpetuated in economics, one, because they're only talking to themselves and have you know, become a world unto themselves. Another reason is perhaps because there is less field-based research, uh, you know, real world research than we need for you know, the climate question and many other questions around us. Um, so in, in the parts of the world where I do research, there is, you know, climate change is very real, and it is manifested in cyclones and floods and drought and, you know, in uh, absolutely debilitating pollution and working conditions, livelihood, etc. Uh, and in, in these parts of the world, the kinds of, you know, the language you were using, or the people who you are citing are using the kinds of, you know, things you were discussing would make very little sense to the fish workers I work with, or, you know, the factory women who I interview, or the politicians, even the politicians who do talk about climate change occasionally. Um, this is so obtuse and difficult to take on board. Again, I totally see why you are, why you are engaging within the discourse, but there is such a big world out there. Um, and for, for my interlocutors in the field, uh, what matters is not even, you know, the 1.5 degrees or the 2 degrees or the 8 degrees. It is livelihood. Um, it is the fact that, you know, salinity ingress is happening into their fields because, you know, the water is coming in from the sea more and more. Um, it is, you know, how do we get hybrid seeds that will, that will be resistant to this kind of salinity, et cetera. So it is a whole different world, a very real engagement with climate questions, which I think the sort of mainstream debate and even these kinds of critiques are missing. Uh, and, you know, I, I would like so much more to see these kinds of very real considerations reflected even in a critique such as yours. Um, and the third point, which takes on from the second one, uh, you ended by saying, you know, make economists more useful, make economics more useful. And you nudged us towards considering things like carbon credits. Again, for, you know, the, the um, woman employed in the factory that I was just talking about, office workers, um, they might just be coming on to the carbon grid. So, you know, for them, uh, or, you know, be used, their electricity use, their use of fossil fuels is going up, not down. Um, that doesn't mean it should go indefinitely up, but things like carbon credits are, are you know, another world for much of the world, for, you know, much of the human population. Uh, and that is why we need to talk not just about the temperature rise or fall or you know econometric graphs etc we need to be talking about climate you know climate justice as social justice uh, we need to be talking about climate debt and reparation uh, and perhaps it's unfair <laughs> to you know take you on a different path when that is not what you set out to do in your talk but to make economics useful or to make discussions about climate change useful we cannot uh, forget these very fundamental questions so I will stop there and uh, perhaps in, in your response, I know I have been fairly, you know, quite unfair <laughs> in the kinds of points I've been raising, but perhaps you can, you can tell us how we can make economics and economists more useful from a global South perspective. Okay, well, look, uh, first of all, um, I, I agree with most, most, much of what you've said. Um, the problem we face, and this is where we've been led astray, is policymakers need numbers. 
and the, in the same way that uh, chiefs needed uh, uh, witch doctors 2,000, 3,000 years ago, okay? You don't do anything without chicken, consulting the chicken entrails. And unfortunately, economists are the ones who get to read our modern version of chicken entrails. And that's really led us astray dramatically. If we didn't have economists, we'd be much better off. But humanity abhors lack of knowledge more than it abhors being wrong, unfortunately. So you have a version of knowledge being produced by the economists, and that's what really dominated how we thought about this. We've got to clear them out of the way. And that's what I'm trying to do with my work. So if you, these are the numbers you've been relying upon, you've been reading the wrong chickens. Uh, it's time to get rid of them. Stop listening to economists on climate change. And whether they modeled it or not, and they found actually, uh, just don't let them talk about it anymore. Okay? Even if they want to build Ramsey models, let them build Ramsey models, entertain themselves. Just don't publish anything on climate ever again. Uh, that would be the best thing economists can do. I agree completely about the need for more field-based research. Uh, the, the, the lack of connection with the field is, is ridiculous in economics. One of my favourites there, for example, is the theory they have of the, the theory of the firm. You'll see economists drawing a, a supply curve, getting more expensive, supply getting more expensive as volume increases. Every empirical study that has been done, this is field research, every empirical study done has shown that doesn't apply in the real world, rather than what economists call marginal productivity diminishing, therefore causing marginal costs to rise with output, the opposite has been found. If you define such a thing as marginal productivity, it rises with volume rather than falls. So supply curves slope down, not up. Uh, now, the last person to find this was Alan Blinder who was a past deputy president of the American Economic Association. Brilliant research, found, surveyed 15% of America's GDP, found that 89% of those firms had falling, not rising marginal cost, said it was an incredible, an incredibly bad news for economic theory. Go and get a copy of Blinder's textbook from the library. You'll find he regurgitates the same old marginal cost rising stuff and doesn't even quote his own research that contradicts it. So the failure to do empirical research, field research, what you're talking about, and the failure to take a notice of it when you do do it is endemic to economics and one of the many reasons it needs to be reformed. Uh, on the universal carbon credit, I got asked a question. This is um, uh, Joe, I think. Is it Joe, Joe Burlington? Uh, yes, asked a question about the car universal carbon credit. And the idea there is that we, we have to find a way of, of encouraging less carbon use which doesn't penalise the poor, in fact, which rewards the poor. And, uh, and I think this has got to be done on a national scale, first of all, because frankly, nothing ever gets done at the international scale. If you want to make sure something doesn't happen, require it to have international agreement. But if you do it at the national level, even at the national level, it could have dramatic impacts upon our consumption. So the concept is to have a universal carbon credit, and I'll, show, I'll share screen so I can show uh, this proposal, that part of the proposal. You'd have the central bank uh, every um, a day effectively giving you a universal carbon credit, which was equivalent to the average carbon consumption of your society. Of course, Americans get more than Indians initially. I just want to think it's going to be politically workable to begin with. But because the income distribution is so incredibly skewed in all of our societies, 95% of the population would get a universal carbon credit that exceeded their usage of carbon. So they'd, be, they'd have to pay money to buy goods, They'd also be paying carbon credits to buy goods. They would run out of money quite possibly, but they'd never run out of carbon credits. The rich would be the other way around. They'd never run out of money, but they'd rapidly run out of carbon credits for their jets and so on. So they would have to buy carbon credits off the poor. And that would redistribute, dramatically redistribute income from the rich to the poor very effectively. And we'd also set a carbon price set by the market, not by economists coming up with fantasy numbers about the social cost of carbon. So I think that would be a much more effective uh, uh, way of going about things. And it's carbonwatchdog.org proposal, where you'll find that proposal written up by uh, my collaborator on that front. So that would be, I think, a very feasible way to reduce that burden and cause some of the redistribution of income we're talking about as well. Um, and, um, and in terms of inequality, I completely agree. Uh, there's a massive level of debt which is held by the, it's not government debt that matters, it's personal debt that matters, personal and corporate debt. And of course, a lot of that debt is owed by the poor to the rich as well. So we need a, a jubilee, and I've worked out how do we could have a, a modern debt jubilee as well as bringing in something like carbon credits. The debt jubilee would be one-off. The universal carbon credit would be a permanent scheme. 
I think it's feasible to do things like that and address the issues you're talking about rather than ignoring them as economists have done so far. Thank you very much, Steve. Again, a lot of matter for further debates here, but we will have a speaker in Hillary term who will be speaking about how to reduce uh, carbon without reducing um, um, the, the standards of living in, in uh, the developing South. So um, I think he will answer many of the points that Nikita is raising. That leaves us with Matthew. Matthew, please, um, could you share your comments with us now? Sure, I'll be as quick as possible um, because I'm well out of my league in terms of um, theoretical economics. Uh, but I would agree with what um, Steve and Nikita said in, in regards to economists not being good in terms of empirics. They're, they're not, well, I'll leave it to Steve to argue they're not good at mathematics. I, I, I would say there's a few that, that are out there, but they're definitely not good scientists from what I've seen, uh, particularly in terms of to what extent they um, apply uh, empirical evidence to their models, which, um, I mean, the DICE model that Nordhaus put together, I don't think that is well regarded within the energy economy uh, field. Um, and it certainly doesn't pass any sort of empirical sniff test, as he said. Um, I think there's an idea in economics, I think it was from Milton Friedman possibly, that a model's assumptions don't necessarily have to represent reality. They just have to, the model just has to behave as if uh, those conditions actually do apply. It um, reminds me of a remark someone said that the economics is the only field where we came, we, instead of looking at the, the, the world and how it operates, we came up with a theory and then tried to apply it to the world rather than try and work out how, how the world actually works. Um, now, the simplicity of DICE is not, partic not necessarily problematic. The, the problem is that, as Steve showed, they're not necessarily incorporating the key dynamics. Uh, he's shown some uh, problems in terms of the damage functions. The research that we're doing has shown that um, it, they're also not incorporating another nonlinear dynamic that was is particularly important and that is around technological progress um, and um, yeah so the work that we're doing uh, has shown that um, the 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 technological progress we're seeing in um, clean energy technologies like renewables uh, batteries electrolyzers um, if you look at the empirical evidence for these uh, and these are not included in any of the models um, the the, the costs of these um, technologies have been declining for decades and the best prediction for their future decline, future performance is their past. Uh, and that has been shown mathematically by mathematicians uh, that I work with in, in INET, Professor Doan Farmer. Um, uh, and it's, it's shown that, that um, if we actually move to a world that incorporates more renewables and storage, uh, we could have a world that's cheaper than the current one, than business as usual. Uh, and that is not something that you could get out of the DICE model just by how it's inherently built. Um, and so that in itself is incredibly problematic that not only are we able to, not able to incorporate the, 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 the right dynamics in terms of damages, but also the right dynamics in terms of possible solutions. Um, you know, it's problematic once again because of what David said in terms of um, the nonlinear dynamics of these learning by doing experience curves. Um, the more you deploy these technologies, the more you learn, the, the more the cost decline, the more the cost decline, the more you deploy. Uh, and you can't incorporate that into the model because you get multiple solutions, as David said. And uh, so it's not, and they've been getting it wrong for decades. All these models, you can look quite clearly in the, the work that we've got um, that's available on the INET website shows that quite clearly how poorly they've been doing it for, for how long. And to Nikita's point and Steve as well, there, there's some sort of insular club, some of these journals, the economic journals, uh, Nature, Climate Change, some of them are like society magazines. They review each other's work uh, as, as long as you don't um, 
counter their conclusions too much, you'll be able to publish. But if you do, you don't get published. And and so that we're not holding each other to the standards that you know the the climate modelers all have to validate their models and calibrate them. The, the economic models don't, and it's just uh, you know, horribly problematic. Uh, anyway, I'll leave it there because we've run out of time. Completely Thank agree. You. Sorry, completely. Yeah. No, sorry, Steve. Okay. I was just going to invite you to okay. respond. Yeah. Uh, completely agree uh, about the assumptions. And this is why it is economists, as Diego just asked a little question there. It is economists. No other discipline would let the nonsense assumptions that Nordhaus put forward get through referees, like assuming that 87% of industry is going to be unaffected by climate change. Okay, that's sorry. You don't know what you're talking about. Throw the paper out. That should have happened. Did any student do that? I'd throw their essay out. They don't understand what the issue is. You shouldn't be published. You shouldn't even be, you shouldn't even pass an undergraduate degree on it. Now, why does this happen? It's because of the whole assumptions don't matter stuff from Milton bloody Friedman. And um, I mean, it, 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 the classic argument was that we have an as if approach, you know, uh, so people playing pool act, acting as if they can solve the complicated Newtonian calculation that you'd know some of the work in INET, INET's helped on that whole front about heuristics are used instead. That's what we actually do rather than solve those equations. Uh, but the as if assumption has been said, it, 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 Milton actually said at one point, the more ridiculous the assumptions, the better the theory. And he has a footnote to say, well, that doesn't apply the opposite. You know, a ridiculous set of assumptions won't give you a good theory. But fundamentally, the more unrealistic, the better. Okay. Now that's nonsense. Uh, and the best work on that is done by Musgrave, Alan Musgrave, wrote a beautiful paper on the uh, uh, called, uh, uh, I think I've gotten the actual title, but Alan Musgrave from Kyklos Journal. And he said, you can divide assumptions into three classes, simplifying, uh, um, uh, domain assumptions and heuristic. Now, simplifying is things like ignoring that there are trees on the route of the London Underground. Okay, of course that makes it better. But here, uh, domain ones are assumptions which, if the assumptions are correct, your theory is correct. But if your assumptions are wrong, your theory doesn't apply. Now, in this particular case, the assumptions economists defend are domain assumptions. Okay, so they're assuming that 87% of industry won't be affected. If that were true, then climate change wouldn't be a problem. If it's not true, we're fucked. Pardon the French, but we're fucked. Got a few Australians here, I can get away with swear words. Okay. And, and that's the sort of thing economists defend. They use the cover of simplifying assumptions to defend domain assumptions. And I had a little in my new book, I have a chapter called The Neoclassical Disease. And I think it is a disease of the mind to allow this to happen. It comes back to the field research thing we were discussing earlier as well. Uh, in, that, in that world, once you start making that stuff, it's a slippery slope to accepting garbage. And that's what economists accept, unfortunately, is their assumptions. So that's vital. We have to get rid of that. We need realism. We need field research. We need to respect the empirical world rather than writing fantasies about it and calling them simplifying assumptions. On the clean tech, uh, yes, the costs have been declining. The trouble is the scale of the conversion that's necessary is so gigantic that we may exhaust the minerals that are necessary to go across to that with the current technologies we have. For example, we're running out of silver. Okay? And if you want to upgrade and in, in, dramatically increase the number of solar uh, cells you've got, that's a dramatic increase for the demand of silver. And we, if we actually went to the stage where we completely replaced the uh, 80% of energy that's not renewable with uh, photovoltaics, we'd exhaust the silver supplies. So we have to, and that's not, it's not the only one by far. So there's so many things we need to, to do to, uh, to cover the, the aggregate demands of that sort of conversion. That's where Simon Mocha's work is so important on this particular front. Um, and, and therefore, we, it isn't an easy to make that transition. And I'll come back to something Joe has also asked in terms of carbon dioxide and the, and the, the speed at which this is happening. This is a physicist saying that uh, all the talk of 2040, 2050 is too late, completely agree. Um, we've now got the, the balance being done dramatically. Would the stuff I'm talking about in terms of tradable credits be enough to slow us down to give us a chance? Frankly, no, it's too late. The reason I want my universal carbon credit idea or tradable carbon credits as well is that 
it's something which could be used in the aftermath where we find we have to drastically reduce consumption to have any chance of surviving as a civilization. So I, I want UCs in there not to stop us hitting the wall, but to mean we can maybe slow us down a bit so we don't hit the wall at quite the same speed. But then when we're on the other side of the wall and trying to reconstruct human civilization, we have a rationing scheme which would work. If we try to bring in an after the crash, it's going to be Mad Max world. So that's where he's not put it forward. It works on both sides of the um, of the of the system. And Joe's asking for something on the debt jubilee. You'll have to go to my Patreon site, I'm afraid, Joe. I haven't had a chance to write that up properly. I've got a couple. I've got a proposal there, and it turns up in my new book. So the book the book uh, title is sort of my image behind me. It's called the New Economics of Manifesto, and I do go through a debt jubilee in that book and the the technical elements of enabling a debt jubilee. Basically, it's using the state's capacity to create money, to cancel uh, credit-based money and turn it into a feedback money, and therefore drastically reduce the level of debt. And to my amazement, it also caused an economic boom. Now, I don't necessarily want a boom there, but it, when you redistribute income from the rich to the poor, of course, you cause a boost in aggregate, uh, aggregate consumption. Thank you so much, Steve. I think you have answered quite a few of the questions we have in the Q&A. We have put these questions open so everyone can read them. I do feel that the question put by Arian Vershu, and sorry if I don't pronounce very well, is an interesting one that we could revisit in mm -hmm. the sense that perhaps, maybe I'm reading something in that question, but I'm reading that opposition between economics who have models who are not real and the scientists who are empirically based and have, have, are in touch, if you wish, with the empirical reality is a bit problematic in my view. Um, I mean, there is a lot of research as well that shows that there is a lot of modeling in uh, climate science, in, in earth science, and that it is not really very real either. And so we are faced with this complexity of uncertainty, what is reality and how can we, you know, guide uh, us ourselves as human. Um, we need models in other words. So could you say something mm. a little bit more on yeah. why you think, why do you believe the science if you wish? Why don't you believe the, the economic economist models and why do you believe so much in the models coming from the scientists? Well, the econ economic models are fantasy. I mean, as I said, the, the, the assumptions are bad, the empirical data is garbage, um, uh, the uh, the understanding, they, they, they've they basically confused climate with weather. If, could you say a little bit more on the scientist modeling okay, and, science, and, science, and, science, and empirical data? <laughs> scientist modeling is based on, on the thermodynamic principles which go back 150 years. So we know, for example, that the reason that Earth's temperature has been relatively constant for the last 10,000 years is the energy coming in has been balanced by the energy going out. And that was in a context of where carbon dioxide was 280 parts per million. And carbon dioxide works as a, as a reflector effectively, the way you can think about it, little mirrors in the sky. And so when the, when the, the, the David, you're shaking your head on the analogy? You unmute yourself. I think David will have a chance to come back okay, because okay. he asked okay. me- Carbon dioxide, right carbon dioxide is, is, is slows down the retransmission of energy from the planet back out into outer space again. That's why it's, it, it, and it's, it's only a trace element. The amount of uh, extra, uh, if you look at the amount, of, the amount of warming we're going to get, say if it's say six degrees increase, only about one sixth of that would actually come from carbon. The carbon dioxide causes more water vapor and the water vapor is the main one that actually also absorbs and slows down the retransmission of the energy. So as we go from 280 parts to 415 parts from where we are now, that has set in train a dramatic increase in the level of temperature of the planet, just because we're, we're absorbing more of the solar radiation, reflecting it more slowly, so the place heats up. The, the, the analogy I can give, and you might like this for your kids, is put a, put a, a, put a, a, um, a soup, you know, put put a, a, a saucer on the on the stove and get the temperature to eighty degrees, let's say, and then put the lid on. See so what happens to the temperature. That's really what we're doing to the to the planet. Uh, now, all the thermodynamics of that is extremely well known, 
It's based on energy balance equations, which go back 100 years. Uh, it's based on the knowledge of the role of carbon dioxide. The scientists are physically grounded in the real world, and they're testing their models all the time. As, as Matthew said, they've got to, uh, they, they have to test their models against each other. And there's an incredible level of testing of models. And those models, when you look at the, the range of predictions they make about the impact of the level of carbon dioxide on the temperature and so on, uh, the precipitation predictions they're making, they're spot on. They're not, they're, not, they're not deterministically so, but they cover the range of what we're seeing in the actual data. And, the, and for example, things like what happens if we lose the Arctic? The Arctic is a reflector. 90% of the solar energy that falls on the Arctic gets reflected back again by the ice. Now, if we go from it being an ice, uh, ice covered during summer to, uh, to water during summer, we go from reflecting 90% of the energy to absorbing 90% of the energy. Now, the amount of energy we're talking about, the impact of that absorption is equivalent to 10 to 1,000 gigatons of carbon dioxide being added to the temperature of the planet. That 1,000 gigatons is about 40 years of current generation of carbon dioxide. So the tipping point of the Arctic will increase the temperature or well, effectively another you know 40 years of current levels of carbon dioxide output that's why it's a tipping point it accelerates the whole process and and what there's some very interesting speculative work being done now what does it mean for climate as well well the arctic is currently the coldest point on the northern hemisphere that's where the uh, polar winds circulate around the polar vortex for obvious reasons. If it disappears and Greenland becomes the coldest point, then between winter and summer, you're going to get a one or 2,000 kilometre rotation in the, in the movement in the point of rotation of the main currents in the Northern Hemisphere. That's why you're going to get crazy weather in Europe, one of the many reasons. And that is what's called climate change. It's changing the actual overall dynamics of the weather patterns of the planet and drastically so. So that sort of stuff is, is well understood by scientists. Uh, they, they don't know what's going to happen in the future particularly, but they do know what happened in the past. So they use paleontological records that go back well over a million years. In some cases, they're going back 50 and 60 million years. So, and they're saying what had happened at different carbon levels and so on when there are natural forces that cause those carbon levels to go up. There is, you, you have to have respect for the, what the scientists have done. I have contempt for what the economists have done, and it's justifiable contempt. Thank you, Steve. Well... We, we will need to let uh, David come back um, and, and defend uh, the economist in his own way. David. <laughs> let me take, say two things. First of all, let me commend to everybody the very careful criticism of the conventional author, the orthodoxy, which Matthew's put in front of us. What you said, Matthew, I think, and the criticism you put forward, extraordinarily helpful. The second thing is to say we can't allow Steve to get away with saying don't allow economists to analyse economic issues. I said, this no, is I did, I said, I said climate no. issues, David, not economic issues. Uh, uh, climate issues. I'll change my statement. This is profoundly reactionary. It's just like the hard left in the 1970s. It's especially reactionary when you make random, unfocused, undisciplined attacks on on, on economic analysis. Uh, academic work requires better discussion than this. Can I commend to you discussing the orthodoxy in the way that Matthew has done? I've done that, David. I've done it for debunking economics. If you haven't read it, I'd like to get your critical reaction to it. And I'm doing it in my new book as well. There is an enormous... I don't... I, I don't I'm, not, I'm not describing your book. I'm describing the random unfocused remarks which you made in this talk which the audience needs to recognize as they're not being... random and they're not unfocused if you want um, to give names okay give okay names. i think Sorry, i should David, intervene I'm... here and yeah. um, you know that's the problem when people are passionate about their debates hmm, even yeah. academics they tend to turn into polemics and i think we need hmm. to recognize that thank um, you very we much can Laurie. allow yes. polemics yes. to exist to a certain thank extent you. but uh Please, I hope you will continue to discuss among yourself. You, you both have very important arguments to make. And what we want to create here at Audit is a safe public space where people can discuss these very contentious, very complicated ideas um, with respect for each other's perspective. And I think we have um, achieved that. Yeah. 
Um, we know that Australian culture maybe is actually also maybe quite different, much more straightforward in their approach to polemics, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but thank you so much to all of you. Thank you to our audience. Um, if you want to get better answers to your questions, I'm sure that you can email uh, Steve and he will be more than happy uh, to engage with you further. I do ask everyone to think about what has been said today. And um, if any students, any, any young researchers would want to, put, to create another side event on any of these issues, please um, approach Diego or myself uh, with your ideas. And thank you, thank you so much, Steve. I know it's very, very late for you and that might be part of the issue as well. It must be like two o'clock in the morning for you. We are so uh, grateful for your presence, for your intervention and to all our speakers, all the people who responded as well. So please join me uh, to applaud you. Thank you. I'm very sorry that we can't share a, a drink or any yeah. kind of the hospitality we want to, to have, but it will happen. And, um, and hope to see you to, um, to the next talks uh, that we will be organizing. Thank you. Okay, I'm just uh, typing some notes to myself there and uh, a note to Matthew as well. So thanks very much. Um, I'll stand by my provocative statements and uh, I want to see, uh, uh, let's get, you know, let's, let's, let's realize what economists call a sunk cost, David. This is a sunk cost. Throw it away. If you want to start again, start again. If you get the same answers these guys got, I'll throw that away as well. Steve, there's good oh, stuff my. out there. Let's all, do the, <laughs> let's all do the good stuff cooperatively together. I'm happy I think to do it, but uh, oh, we're going to take, take it to Matthew's ideas about our assumptions. Bye, all. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank, Thank you, you again. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> Bye.